Sorry, meeting's over. Come back next week, starts at seven. You the counselor? Who you looking for? The guy who helps all the sad people around here. What can I do for you? I'm not sure you can do anything but I'm willing to let you try. Try? Try what exactly? To convince me. Convince you of what? To live. You don't want to live any longer? I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to end my life tonight. Not violently, not as a message or statement. I just don't want to be alive anymore. Not emotional or crazy, I've thought this through. Just in case I'm wrong, I'm gonna give you one hour to convince me not to. And if at the end of that hour, I find no compelling reason that my life should continue, I'll end it. There's always a reason when someone doesn't want to live any longer. Will you do it? Why me? I walk by this church three times a week on my way home from work. On Thursdays, I see people coming out of here and they have smiles on their faces, open their eyes. 
I'd like to give you a shot at giving the same to me. You know I'm supposed to call the police when an attendee threatens violence against themselves? No, no. And you can. If you don't know my name, where I live. And if you do, I'll walk out. I could try to stop you. No, I can't. So I have one hour to try and argue with a stranger who's made up his mind to end his life. Not to. That's it. And you've already planned this out? Thought this through? Yeah. Then why are you here? I want to be sure. It's not something you can take back once you go through with it, you know? <laughs> I see. So where do we start? Never really done this before. Only seen it in the movies. Start with you. All right then. What is your name? My name is Jack. What's your name? Nice to meet you, Jack. I'm Leslie. It's nice to meet you, Leslie. What do you do, Jack? You'd laugh if I told you. I won't. I promise. Aren't you supposed to ask me questions about my childhood? Something like that? Would you like me to? No. Nah. You're one of those kind of counselors. What do you mean? Nah, you know the type. The one to ask a bunch of inane questions to make it look like they're driving at something when really they're just wasting time. Okay. Tell me about your childhood. How many siblings you have? Only child. Did you enjoy being an only child? That's what I knew. I guess that means I'm spoiled. But whatever advantage I had in being unique, I paid for in being lonely. Were you lonely as a child? Yeah. I was. But I didn't know I was until I was older and saw kids who weren't. And I figured it out. What kind of kids? You know those kids. Come from good families. They're brothers, sisters, dog, picket fence, moms to bake cookies, dads to play catch with. Those kind of kids. You wanted that? I thought I did. Why do you think that is? We only have our limited experience to judge how life ought to be lived, right? Our perspectives are Limited to our own experience, yes. But humans have an intrinsic knowing of how things should be. Hmm. How about parents? Were you close to them? Your mother? I love my mom. I mean, I suppose that most boys do, right? She was all I had, really, so. What was she like? She had long blonde hair blue eyes. When she looked at you, she saw you. She spoke carefully, as if she didn't want to scare you. Were you scared as a child? Yeah, but not of the usual things, like monsters in the closet or the boogeyman. I was more scared of not knowing where wind comes from, or if heaven would be boring. I'm never really scared of the dark, though. I seem much safer than the light. What does she do? Waitress, receptionist, cashier, among other soul-killing jobs that barely paid the bills. Who was she? She was someone who tried to make ugly things beautiful. What do you mean by that? We didn't have much. She struggled to make ends meet for the two of us. I grew up mostly in a small apartment that was constantly falling apart, but she covered its walls with art she found at thrift stores. When the TV broke or the lights went out, she'd make us do talent shows for each other there in the living room. She sounds lovely. She was. Have you, have you spoken to her recently? No. 
Maybe you should try speaking to her about what you... Speaking to you. What about your father? Was he present? He was in and out after I came along. Wasn't around to play catch, if that's what you're asking. When was the last time you saw him? I was a kid. What was he like? I don't know, really. Did your mother ever speak about him? Not really, though I do remember coming home after school one time and finding her burning his pictures in a bowl on the kitchen table. You saw your mother's pain? I guess so. But I could always make her happy. Tell her some jokes, do some tricks, put on a show. She smile again for me. It must be very painful for a child to have to bear the weight of his parents like that. I guess so. How do you feel about your father? I don't. Does it bother you? What bothers me is I can't remember what he looked like. I mean, I did, obviously, for a while. But one night I was lying in bed trying to picture his face. I couldn't. I could only see his back. Even now, when I try to picture him, I can only see the back of his head. I have these flashes of him getting a drink from the refrigerator, yelling at my mom. Going outside for a smoke. But I can only see his back. It's a very common occurrence. I mean, past memories fading like that. I can't remember what he looked like, but I can still smell him. The sour stench of cigarette smoke mixed with the sweet smell of laundry detergent on his shirts. You ever try and find him? I figured if he wanted to know me, he'd get in touch. Do you forgive him? Nothing to forgive. Never owed me anything. Interesting. I know what you're doing. What's that? You're trying to find the thing that makes it all make sense. Makes me all make sense. Maybe he wants to kill himself because of his absent father. Our childhoods can be powerful in shaping us into the people we are today. Sure. I just think you guys rely on that too much. You guys? Yeah. Therapists, psychiatrists, counselors, professionals. You think if you can point to one or two things in someone's childhood that screwed them up, that you can fully understand someone, like an equation. You don't think your childhood is relevant to what you're feeling now? I didn't say that. I just think it's cheating, kind of. But it has proven beneficial in understanding why people, you know. Listen, I'm just saying there are kids who don't have parents and they are better off in doing great. And there are kids who come from great families and they are hooked on drugs. You can't understand humans with a formula. That is true. So I never really went. To therapist? Yeah. I don't want the entirety of my personhood to be summed up with a few clinical concepts. Why are you here now? I want to give it a fair shake. My ego can take it when my life is on the line. That's commendable. What about your family? Mine? Yeah. Aren't we here to talk about you? It's an interesting feeling being asked the questions, isn't it? More people do it than you think. How does that make you feel? Very funny. Do you often use humor to mask what you're really feeling? 
I use humor to give people what they really want. No one actually wants to know what you're really thinking or feeling. I do. Your wish is my command. Have you tried reaching out to anyone? This is me reaching out. Do you have anyone in your life that you can talk to, any friends? What is a friend? I mean, I interact with people. I say, hello, how are you doing? Nice weather we're having. Did you catch that episode last night? Are they my friends? Do I know them? Do they know me? You ever had a best friend? I used to play video games with my friend Michael in his basement when I was a kid. I think that's the closest I've ever come to having a best friend. What happened to him? We started high school. Michael turned out to be really good at playing lacrosse. And I turned out to be really good at reading books alone in the corner of the library. What did you read? <laughs> Things you wouldn't expect. Oh yeah? Yeah. I mean, imagine you'd picture a sad, loner kid reading things like Catcher in the Rye or fantasy fiction, porno magazine, which I did. But those weren't the stories I loved. What stories did you love? Pride and Prejudice, The Importance of Being Earnest, Romeo and Juliet. Hell, I even read The Notebook. Those are classics. You had good taste. If only the cheerleaders had known that. What about those stories that you love? I guess those were the fantasies I wanted to live in. I wanted people paid attention to each other, got involved in each other's lives, fell in love. I never had that. But in all of those stories, the characters were important because of the relationships to each other. That was something I desperately wanted. We all have a desire to be seen and in connection with others. It's good to know I'm not alone. Have you ever been in love? Yes. Tell me about them. I was waiting for this question. Why? Because it's just so cliche. What do you mean? I mean, we are thousands of years into this humanity thing, and we are still obsessed with the same old things. It's stupid. That's human. Same thing. Touche. Have you ever been in love? Why do you want to know? I don't know. I guess I want to know I'm talking to a human? Yes. I have. Thank you. What was her name? Her name was Jenny. How did you meet? We met at a bar. I'm not even a bar guy, but I'll go to this place around the corner from where I live on the weekends. The noise and the lighting made me feel like I was doing something somewhere with someone. Though usually I just read alone in the corner watching all the pretty people laugh at each other's jokes and touch each other's arms, just like high school. She was there one night, sitting at the bar after what looked to be a bad first date in this little red dress. We ended up being two of the last people there. She saw me staring. Came over and asked me what I was reading. Told her. We talked for a moment, and she walked out. The next weekend, the same thing happened. She was there for another disappointing date in her red dress. And I was there reading. It was the third time. She asked me if I wanted to go home with her. And did you go? Of course. Why, of course. But I gotta do your job for you. 
I'm a lonely, isolated individual with a history of abandonment and a deep desire for human connection. How's that? Not bad. So what happened? She brought me to her home. Invited me into her world. That night I made love for the first time, in the dark, with a woman I didn't know but stupidly believed I could love. Probably the romance novel's fault. And why is that stupid? Because what is love? The chemical high you get from being paid attention to? It's irrational. It's just a biological happenstance of chemicals flooding your brain. That's pretty bleak. Reality is bleak. A lot of people find that love is something worth living for. That love is one of the only things in this life that makes it all worth it. What do you say? I think that love is powerful. And with anything powerful, it has the ability to bring life to us or to crush us. But what I know about it is this. There's an infinite supply. And if one has a negative experience with it, there's still so much hope to, to find it in a new way. Maybe. What happened with you and Jenny? We fell in love. Or at least I did. All of me fell all at once, like a wave that knocks you over and wraps you up in its undertow. I didn't have the power to fight it, but I didn't want to. Even if I was drowning, I was drowning in her. She was what I learned to breathe. I kept going to her over and over. After every late night call, I would be there. I was like an addict. I never got enough of it. No matter how tired I was, I needed my fix. I needed her. Well, scientists say that falling in love has the same effect on the brain as cocaine. Drugs seem like they might be a little less complicated. We all have our drugs of choice. For some it's cocaine, video games, porn. And for some it's love. Maybe that's my problem. Not choosing the right addiction. Yeah. See, if you're gonna Choose an addiction, love is by far the best choice. You know, if this whole counselor thing doesn't work out, I think you've got a future in writing greeting cards. Tell me more about her and you. Eventually, I started waking up next to her. We would spend days together, just us, listening to music, eating, drinking, reading. Talking. Eventually I didn't go home. I forgot that I even had a place of my own, or a life of my own for that matter. I became fully enveloped in her world. I wanted to know everything about her, and I wanted her to know everything about me. I told her my dreams, what I wanted to be when I grew up, the secrets I had never told anyone before. She would tell me how lonely she was before me, all the fears she had, 
about all the people who had hurt her. But it was okay now, because whenever she was sad, I could make her smile. The first time in a long time, I belonged to someone, and they belonged to me. Was that a good thing? It's what evolution created to keep the genes passing down. Perhaps we were designed to feel and give love. Maybe that was part of how we're made. So you're one of the ones who thinks we were designed. I guess I am. No offense, but I expected an educated man like yourself to be a little more realistic. We're in the basement of a church. <laughs> Touche. I, uh, I take it you don't believe in God. My mom did. Had the cross necklace and all. She let me wear it sometimes. Until I got made fun of for wearing a woman's necklace to school. She would take me to church every now and again, more so when my dad left. A lot of kids complained. I actually liked it. The stained glass reminded me of my comic books, covered in colorful, fantastic, fictional characters. The sermons were filled with tales from epic and intricate stories. I also liked the smell of old wood. Do you believe in God? I wanted to. For a long time, I wanted to. I mean, what kid, or person for that matter, wouldn't want to believe that someone cared about us enough to make us exist? That we actually matter and that there's more than all this when we die. But you don't. No. Why not? I'd rather not believe in God than hate him. Because if he is real and he is a bastard, he says he loves us while he watches us stumbling around down here in the dark doing nothing. If God is real, I'd have to hate him. And a life spent hating someone you can't change or convince to care about you is a waste. Like your dad? Sure. Just like my dad. What if he does care about you? My dad? God. He couldn't. Why not? Because he lets shit happen. Maybe he can't intervene. Then he's not God. I guess that's one way to see it. What pisses me off is how could a dad who truly cared about his kid watch as they got run over, fell out of a window, got bullied, got mugged, got raped, killed themselves without intervening? That's the age old question. Exactly. I mean, if it's a question we're still asking after all these years, it means we haven't been given a good enough answer to stop asking it. Just because you can't prove something doesn't mean it's not real. If there's nothing that's bigger than all this in your life, then you're doomed to a hopeless existence. Listen, God is fine for those who need to believe there's something else that helps them through their sad days or scary nights like your mom. Sure. Did it help her? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Until cancer ate out her insides at 42 years old. I'm sorry. Well, at least you are because God didn't seem to give much of a damn. It must have been devastating. Doesn't matter. I mean, it does in the end. Do you want that? For things to not matter? No, no, I want things to matter. I want anything to matter. I want what I've done, what I've experienced to matter. I want to matter. And I still hope it all does. 
I'm not one of those guys who pretends it's cool to think that nothing means anything. It's not. It's hell. That's good. Maybe that desire, that, that want was meant to be there. Maybe that's something to hold on to. I have. So many years I have. What happened to your mom? I woke up one morning, I got the call, and I spent the next three months by her side. I'm so sorry. I, I can't imagine how painful that must have been. No, can't. At least I don't think. I don't know, I don't know anything about you. And now you know my whole story. Hopefully it's not the whole story. She just laid there. I watched as day by day, the life drained little by little from her eyes. I just remember the incessant beeping, the whitewashed walls and the smell of fluoride. And I remember thinking how those things were the last things she'd ever hear, see, or smell. The last thing she'd ever feel was pain. I'm so sorry. If there's a God, and he could watch that without caring. Maybe he does. Then why didn't he do anything? I'm gonna ask you another question. Why do you do this? I, um, I wanted to help people. Why? Because I've needed help. We all do sometimes. Does it work? Sometimes? Yeah. I guess you're one of the good guys then. Can I ask you another question? That's why I'm here. Why are you really doing this, Jack? Because I'm tired. That's like. That's it? You're going to kill yourself because you're tired? No. That's not good enough. You don't have to think it is. It's ridiculous. And it's selfish. Selfish? Yes. You're not threatening to kill yourself. You're threatening to kill the entire world so you don't have to deal with it. But that's life. It's painful, but it can also be beautiful. But you have to be able to deal with the pain to ever have a chance of, of, of holding that beauty. And you're just not. I think I never had a chance of convincing you. You made up your mind before you ever walked in here. Leslie, I have dealt with the pain. And yes, I've experienced the beauty, but it never lasts. It never does. And my return on investment just isn't good enough to keep on doing this. Where's Jenny? I don't know. What happened? Yes. Yes, it does. Your story matters. What always happens, we fell apart. Besides, she was never looking for anything more than I am now, an escape. No, that's not an answer. I became heavy, too heavy. I started picking fights, I became jealous and insecure. 
tried to control her so I could keep her with me. I knew we were cracking and I tried to fix it. I tried, I really did. I did everything I could to keep this one and only piece of life with me, but I failed. Good, present, life-giving moments became less frequent. I felt her pulling away. She didn't react to my touch on her skin anymore. When we would kiss, life only flowed from one side. I watched her eyes as they stopped seeing me and began looking past me. And there was nothing I could do. She was the only light I could see in this world. One morning, I woke up and she was gone, just like everyone else. My world finally became totally dark. She wasn't able to handle it. That's too much for anyone to bear. I'm too much for anyone to bear, even myself. No, no, you're not. Then why does everyone leave? because none of us can bear the full weight of each other. Only God can do that. She was the only light I had left. Maybe she was never meant to be your only source of light. Then what is? And there it is. What? No one does. You want the truth, Jack? Here it is. Existence hurts. It hurts like hell, but you're not special. No one escapes the painful touch of this world. Every person you meet is fighting a battle no one else can see. And you can laugh at the ones who hold on, but in my experience, the ones who believe, even when life offers them no reason to, are the ones who find that light. Maybe you're right, Leslie. You don't have to do this, Jack. I don't have to do anything anymore. I've never had very much power in my life, but this one time I do. I can be the one who leaves. Please, don't do this. My time is up. What do you want? Hmm? I'll do anything. I don't want anything. Yes, you do. You want to not feel pain, and I get it. I do. But Jack, there is so much good out there. Life is worth living. There's hope. There's new and, and, and wonderful things if you just hold on. Please, I'm begging you. For me? For you? Leslie, I, I don't even know you. And you don't know me. No one knows anyone. We are all alone in the end. Come on, man. I'm gonna go. No, I'm sorry. I, I, I don't have all the answers. Leslie. This is not your fault. You did and said exactly what you were supposed to. It's time I go. 
Her name is Alice. We fell in love in college. She had big brown eyes and she loved to sing. I used to be late for work because I would listen to her sing in the shower. She liked long walks in the park and holding hands in the movies. We shared everything. We have a son together. His name is Anthony. He looks just like her. He's six. Recently, she passed away. Cancer. And my whole world caved in. I get it. I miss her. I miss her every day. Life hurts without her. But I got to keep it together for Anthony because he's hurting. So last night I, I took him to the show and there was this, this wonderful clown who, he lit up the whole room. And when Anthony saw him, he just, he laughed. He laughed for the first time in three months. <laughs> Maybe I can take you. We can see that clown. Look, I, I know it won't fix everything, but maybe if you could just laugh again, just for a few moments, something would change. Please, let me take you. It, it, it's, it's not far. Maybe he's performing tonight. Not Leslie. How do you know? I. Come on. Please. Do you remember I told you that you'd laugh if I told you what I did? Yes. I'm a clown in a show not too far from here. Three nights a week, I put on my face, carefully, so no one can see. And I walk out on that stage, and I put on a show to give the audience what I cannot give myself. But I'm done. The show is over. It's time to take a bow and let the curtain close. Jack. Please. Thank you, truly.